I love how they preach. I love the old music, the old Jeremiah says, walk ye in the, the old ways, the old past. Ask for the old time, you know, and we live in a society that is just absolutely rushing forward at an unbelievable rate of speed. And uh, God says, go back and look at the old ways. At Sunday school this morning, we were looking at the Exodus and uh, how the Jewish people were harnessed up and brought out. You know what Paul says? That everything may be done decently and in order. That's how God works. You know, God's not in, have you ever noticed that God's not in a rush? He doesn't seem to be hurried by anybody or anything. He takes his, we have these overwhelming, urgent prayer needs and prayer requests and God's just sitting back and said, well, we'll get to that request in just a second. Uh, how about this other stuff that I gave you to do? You're working on that. And that's how God works. And uh, what a blessing Sunday school was this morning. Uh, I got a lot out of that. Uh, open up your Bibles today, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Only opening up this Bible for the second time. I'm afraid to turn the pages. Don't want to rip anything. My wife gave me this. It was my 33rd anniversary of getting saved on Thursday, walking with the Lord for 33 years. And um, what a blessing that that is. And, and he is, I'll tell you, he is faithful. <laughs> he is good and he is true. Um, we struggle with that. I struggle with that. But he doesn't struggle with that. He is, he is faithful all the time. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. It's amazing how many times David keeps popping up in the New Testament. Uh, and it's amazing what's going to happen in the millennium when David gets a, a throne. Um, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, um, and shutteth that no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. Jesus says as, as a smoking reed and a bruised flax, bruised reed and a smoking flax, he said, I won't quench it. If there's a little bit of life left in it, um, somebody once said, if you're going through hell, great, keep going. Yeah. Don't quit. Don't stop. Uh, and the apostle Paul, he went through a hell on earth almost every day of his ministry, but he kept going and he kept going. Um, and he says this, and no man can shut it for thou hast a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for the open door that you've given us this morning, an open door to walk through and, and come to church this morning, an open Bible that we can open up and put in our laps. And Lord, you can speak to us through that. And uh, we're glad and we're grateful to be here this morning, Father God. And we just pray that you be, take me out of the way, Father God. And uh, you speak through me. Let your word shine forth this morning. If there's anybody listening who's not saved, we pray that something will be said and done to lead a lost soul to you. And for those of us that are saved, Lord, get us on fire to get something done for you in these last days. Amen. Amen. All right. God set before us an open door. A lot of people get very confused about the book of Revelation. A lot of people like to make all sorts of interesting cuts in this book and say, well, this isn't for the church and that isn't for the church and this is for who. Uh, I meet people all the time that being born again is just for the Jewish people. It's not for Christians and, and the bride of Christ is not the church and, and people get very, very confused about things. But I think... The Bible really is a simple book. Um, somebody once said that the that the Bible is not so much um, hard to understand as it is to believe. And the things that are happening, Brother Ed, this morning in Sunday school, he was he he said, "Do you believe this book, this Word of God?" Well, then how many of Pharaoh's armies died in the Red Sea? All of them. Right. And when this book says something, it's really not that hard to under. I mean, you have to be saved. There are some minimum requirements. Um, but outside of that, uh, this book is really not so complicated 
as it is hard to believe. There's a man by the name of Hal Lindsey, and back in 1978, he wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Now, you can get excited reading that book. You're not going to get a whole lot of Bible doctrine from Hal Lindsey's book. But that book helped to spark an interest in this book and people getting back into this book. Hal Lindsey would look at the uh, locusts from the book of Revelation coming up out of the pit. And he thought that they were Apache attack helicopters with stinger missiles in their tails. And he was trying to make this one-on-one -on -one correlation because certainly it couldn't be actual locusts with hair like women and faces like men. It couldn't be that coming up out of the pit. Not so much hard. To, I mean, you can read those passages and it clearly says that these very odd, terrifying looking locusts they come up from where they come up out of, and either you believe that or you don't believe that. So today, I just want to bring you a little message on, uh, I gave it a working title. You know, I'm not much, I don't ever think that anybody is going to listen to these sermons that I do and have done for many, many years. But I don't have in my mind, like nobody's ever going to write a book of my sermons uh, at our bookstore, we have all sorts of stuff by Spurgeon and Moody and, you know, the lost sermons of C.H. Uh, Spurgeon. And that's a very interesting book to read. I don't think anybody's ever going to do that with my sermons uh, because my sermons, what I feel God has called me to do is give you something tangible that you can put in your hand, that you can put in your pocket, that you can take with you and you get, that can help you to get something done for the Lord. <laughs> Um, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's something that you go into 90% of any church in America today and you start talking about the judgment seat of Christ and get nothing but blank stares and blank looks. And yet the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, he, he, he is yelling at us to get something done that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ. So. When God puts a sermon on my heart, the idea is I'm not thinking of posterity. I'm not thinking of what would this sermon look like if somebody transcribed it and typed it up. I'm just looking at it like, God, thank you for this little nugget today. Let it help me to get something done for you uh, that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ. So I tentatively titled this message, When God Opens You Up a Door. Now, here in Revelation chapter 3, we have the Philadelphia church. Historically, and, and just about everybody who interprets this, Schofield, Larkin, Ruckman, whoever that you have, um, we look at this church, this Philadelphia church, as the period of time from roughly the publishing of the King James Bible to the end of the 19th century. And you have Whitfield and Peter Cartwright and Moody and Spurgeon. You have Billy Sunday, who still starts in the, the, the end of the 19th century. But then when you cross that border and you get into the 20th century, everything begins to change very, very quickly. So when we say the Philadelphia church, we're looking at this as a church age. And what would correspond to that in church history would be that period of time from roughly the publishing of the King James Bible to roughly the end of the 19th century. And God says this, he says, uh, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it, for thou has a little strength. Uh, if you keep reading in this passage, and I, I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, look at Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <clears throat> if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. It's a very, very simple thing. I was watching people coming in this morning. I was watching as we came in this morning. Door wasn't locked. Handle wasn't complicated. There didn't seem to be a passcode anywhere that I had to reach into my pocket. And now what's that 18 character passcode that I need to have this door? The door just, I just touched it and it kind of just opened up of its own accord. It wasn't hard to get in here this morning. 
Well, it's not hard for you to walk through the open door that God has given you. The only question is, is do you want to walk through that door? You know, many, many times people say, I wish God would use me for something. And then you say to them, well, what are you doing? Well, nothing. <laughs> And it's nice to have wishes, you know? I wish everybody in my family was six feet tall or higher. And I always wish that I would be a minimum of six feet tall. And God never granted that wish, and I am, I am not six feet tall. And we have things that, that would be great if they would happen. But um, as my dad would tell me at the start of every summer vacation when I was in high school, He'd say, I'll give you one week of your own time, whatever you want to do, I give you one week, and then you're going to put on the Shoe Leather Express, you're going to go out and find a job. He called it gainful employment. He said, you're going to get out and you're going to be gainfully employed by the start of week number two. And um, in Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now turn to John 10. As we set the table for what God is talking about when he says an open door. This is what he's talking about. John chapter 10. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. John 10, 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. When I was a young boy growing up in a Roman Catholic church, I was told that if you want to get God's attention, you got to go to his mother. That's what we were taught, that Mary was not so much the earthly mother of Jesus Christ, but we were taught um, that if you want to talk with God, you've got to go through his mom. And then they would use, you know, kind of, easy to understand rationale, they would say, well, if you really needed something from your parents, would you approach your World War II dad <laughs> and ask him for some silly thing that you wanted? Or would you approach the softer touch of your mom to talk to dad? And yeah, it's like, okay, that makes sense, but it's not biblical. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the door. There's only one door. So when we're talking this morning about the idea of when God opens you up a door, that door from cover to cover is Jesus Christ. And you know what a door does? A door lets you in. A door also keeps you out if that door happens to be locked. Now, for all of us who are saved, God gives an open door. How much ministry do you want to have? Now, the problem is when people think of ministry, and I have known a lot of people in ministry over many, many years. And sometimes somebody gets saved and they want to get into ministry. And you know what they think that ministry is? This wooden pulpit, standing here with this book, addressing a crowd of people like we're doing this morning. And everybody is dressed nice and sitting clothed and in their right minds. And everybody's shaking hands. And what a great time of fellowship that is. And that is an aspect of ministry. But you know what real ministry is? Is when you have new neighbors across the street and they're meth addicts and there's problems and now things are coming into the neighborhood that maybe shouldn't be there and windows are getting broken and cars are getting broken into. Um, and what is that? Well, that's a criminal situation, but that is a ministerial situation. Because if you're the same person in the neighborhood where there's trouble, who does God expect to at least make an attempt to step into the breach and say, hey, can I, hey, nice to meet you. Welcome to the neighborhood. 
Now, they may or may not be the ones flattening your tires. They may may or not be the ones uh, breaking into your car, but we are called to go out to the streets. Name for me one preacher in this book from Genesis to Revelation that wasn't a street preacher. Name one. Every single person in this book is a street preacher. And people talk about, well, you know, we got to get back to that first century Christianity. Um, nobody wants first century Christianity because it was hard. Now, we have made it into this mythical thing. And we look at first century Christianity and we see Paul and, you know, he's doing his thing and he's, you know, he's pleading on Mars Hill and doing all that stuff. Um, but but it was a rough time. And and one by one, all the apostles are getting executed by the Ro Roman government and all these nasty things are happening. And, and But what is that? That is ministry. And that's what we are all called to do. Um Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And I want to give you a couple of examples this morning of people that God opened a door for. Isaiah chapter 6. And let's look at verses... One through eight. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I don't want to read too much into that first verse, but he took his eyes off the earthly king. The earthly king was dead, and now he could see the Lord. Um, I have people who come to me and say, I'm saved, but I never hear from the Lord. Well, how often do you open up this book? When you pray, that's you talking to God. That's a monologue. And it's necessary. And it's important. When you read this book, that's God talking to you. Verse 2. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, and having a live coal into his hands, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I said all that to say this. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I believe, this is just my opinion now, but I believe that everybody who is saved is given a course of work to do. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. And last time I spoke about if you were to go to college, if you were to have like a correspondence school or something, um, you would be given coursework and then you would be graded on that coursework when your year your program, whatever it was that you had signed up for, was finished. Well, each and every person in this room who is saved has been given a course of work to do. Now, you might say to me, hey, brother, I've been saved for 10 years and I don't know what my course is. Why not? This book will tell you what you I can't tell you. I'm not a charismatic. I, I can't lay my hands upon the top of your head and said, the Lord told me to give you this today. The only thing the Lord told me to give you today was this book. <laughs> That's the only thing I have to give you this morning is this book. But I know that when I read in this chapter six, God wasn't making Isaiah become a prophet. And if you look at somebody like Jeremiah, 
before I formed thee in the womb. I, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Well, you get to chapter 20, chapter 21. What does Jeremiah do? He quits. He wasn't forced to do it, even though God said, before you were, before you were ever born, I ordained you to be a prophet, but there was still a level of responsibility on the part of the prophet Jeremiah. And he gets some bad treatment, he gets some rough treatment, he gets thrown into the sewer, and he's in waste up to his neck, and he's thrown into the second level of the jail, and all these different things. And finally he says, and I, it's either chapter 20 or 21, he says, you know what, I quit. This prophet life is not what I thought that it would be. And then he says, that's it. And he hangs up in my mind. I see him hanging up his robes and uh, doing whatever he had to do. And say, okay, I'm out of here. I quit. And then he's walking along the streets and he sees people profaning, profaning the name of the Lord. And what does he do? He says, thy word was shut up in my bones. And it was like a fire. And he said, I could not forbear, right? That wasn't God making Jeremiah do that because he had been ordained to be a prophet uh, before he was born. That is Jeremiah coming to the understanding, just not unlike when you look at the prodigal son in the book of Luke. And uh, he wants his inheritance from his dad so badly, he can't even wait for him to die. It doesn't even look like his dad is sick. He just wants that money and he takes it and he spends it on riotous living. But God lets him get all the way to the hog pen. And it says, and when he came to himself and he said, okay, I just blew through this fortune. And now here I am in the hog pen. But you know what? I could just keep on walking. And a lot of people do. One, one of the sad things about being saved for 33 years is watching over time and i've seen people start out really really strong i have seen people start out and they were like this is it and i am sold out to the lord um and then something happens adversity happens a setback happens uh, a relapse happens whatever the case may be and then you check on those people a couple of years later and they're not serving the, the lord yes they, they backslid and they fell into trouble. They fell into problems. Maybe they relapsed on something, but you know what? That's why the prodigal son is in the Bible. One of the things that we see with the prodigal son is he had to swallow that pride, right? And he had to go back to the father. He had to face the brother. He had to face the mother. He had to face all of the people in his father's compound. I don't know how big it was. And he had to face whatever the neighbors had to say about him, right? Now, sometimes we watch and somebody has a relapse or they backslide, and we say that that person is not qualified to continue in the ministry. And you know what God says? How bad do you want to serve me? Well, Lord, I want to serve you real bad. You want to serve me with all your heart? Yes, Lord, I do. Well, do you want to serve me so badly that you're now going to go back you're going to walk the steps that you just, you're going to go walk it backwards. And now you're going to face the music. And now you're going to say, I still stand for the Lord. I still preach his word. Uh, that's really, really hard to do. And over the years, I have seen people in that position. And a lot of those people don't come back. But what does God's word say? What is in your heart to do? The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Um, there's this book, and I, I forget who wrote this book. It's called Why God Used D.L. Moody. And people were trying to figure out, how is it possible that this man with a fourth grade education could rise to the absolute pinnacle of Christian ministry and they say that in the 25 years that he ran his campaigns, that um, 100 million people listened to him preach. Can you imagine 100 million people listening to anything that you had to say? Right? I mean, it's a little daunting to say the least. I can't imagine 
uh, 100 million people listening to anything I've ever said. And of those 100 million people, approximately 1 million people came forward and they prayed to get saved. Why did God use D.L. Moody? Because Moody wanted to be used in spite of his lack of qualifications. Moody wanted to be used in spite of his lack of education. Moody wanted to be used in spite of the fact that every church that he went to told, they called him Crazy Moody. And the reason why they called him Crazy Moody uh, was that he was excited about serving the Lord. It kind of reminds me of Brother Ron. Brother Ron is always up and he's always ready to go. He's always ready to jump into the action. He wants to get something done. And when I think about Moody, I think about somebody like that. And they, but they called him Crazy Moody. Why? Because everybody else was just now sit down and be quiet and fold your hands and we're going to have this service. And when the service is done, you're going to go back to your regular lives and we'll meet again a Wednesday or a Friday, whatever it happened to be. And Moody said, you know what? That's when I read this book, that's not what I get. And so what was considered crazy when he started, he became the most successful evangelist since the Apostle Paul, but he had to do it in spite of everybody telling him that it couldn't be done, and if it could be done, he was absolutely not the person to do it. Now, that was the open door for Isaiah. Oh, oh man. Um, Genesis 37. Let me show you the open door for Joseph. Now, when I was praying about this sermon, there were so many different ways that I could have gone with this. Like the life of Joseph has so many different ups and downs and nooks and crannies. Uh, but Genesis 37, look at verses 9 through 11. And he, Joseph, dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee before uh, to the earth? <laughs> Rhetorical question. And his brother, his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. Can you imagine what it was like to be Joseph? He was so favored by the father that the father made him this coat of many colors. They made a Broadway play out of that. I remember back in the 70s or 80s, Donny Osmond, uh, he, he kind of rose to Broadway fame playing Joseph. And they called it the Technicolor dream coat. But can you imagine what it would have been like? Now, I have to read something into the passage that doesn't appear to be right here. It is obvious that Joseph and especially when you consider what he's about to do, that he is in fairly close contact with, with God. And he understands that these dreams that he's having, it's not just because he had a lot of pizza the night before or something spicy. I think Joseph very well understands that this is the Lord talking to him. Now, what does he do with this crazy dream? And his father says, wait a second. You think we're going to bow down to you? You're my favorite son. I made you this coat. But you think that we're going to bow down to you, that you're going to be in charge? Turn to chapter 41 in Genesis. Just going to read one verse here. Let's answer that rhetorical question that the father was asking. Genesis 41, 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See? I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now, that's great. And if you just go from the first thing I read to the last thing that I read, you would think, wow, I'd like to be like Joseph. Wouldn't that be great? But how about all that crazy stuff in the middle? And his brothers get so consumed with jealousy that they throw him into a pit. And they have such hate. And, and this was the part about the story of Joseph that has always stuck in my craw. They hate Joseph so badly that they are willing to destroy their father, who really is the innocent party. 
And how did they destroy their father? By taking that coat and putting animal blood on it and say, see, your favorite son, he's dead and all we have is this coat. Now, Joseph went through unbelievable trials and tribulations. He gets sold into slavery. He's thrown into a pit and he gets falsely accused. He gets thrown into the jail. And every time God gives him favor, the world steps in and it's almost like with Moses and Aaron and they're in front of Pharaoh and God says to Moses, here, do what I tell you to do. And for a brief period of time, the devil's workers can go head to head with God. But it's only for a very brief period of time. And then eventually they say, wow, whatever that is, we have, I don't even know what that is. Joseph was given an open door. And I believe that open door started when God gave him that dream. And then, and again, just my opinion, said to Joseph, now when you wake up, I want you to go tell that to your, your father, your mother, and your 11 brothers that you're already on very shaky ground with. You go tell them the dream that I gave you because it's going to come true and all this great stuff is going to happen. Now, what's the equivalent of that for us? We get saved, and I don't know about you. I don't know what type of family that you were born into, what type of family that you were raised in. Um, but I know that in my own family, I got saved on March 14, 1991, five minutes to midnight, right before my um, 30th birthday. And I was so excited. I went to sleep that night, and I felt lit now. I didn't have any Christian friends. Nobody gave me a track. I had never been to church, never heard somebody preach, but God saved me anyway with a King James Bible from the Gideons. I got saved on John 3, 16. And, and I had the best night's sleep that I had in years. Now I was only 29, just about to be 30. At that point, I had spent three years working in Hollywood. Um, not gonna glorify that, but I was, at a fairly good level, at a fairly good pace. People were just beginning to recognize me on the street from the work that I was doing. And, and uh, I, I was near the edge of a complete breakdown. And I would, it looked like I had the greatest life, but it was terrible. And I was drinking and staying out late and just, you know, everything that you shouldn't do. And I felt like physically, spiritually, emotionally, I was about to collapse. And then I opened up that King James Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I knew that was Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him, and I'm like, well, who, whosoever, maybe that's me too. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know what I did? Now, this is with I had never seen a Christian movie. I had no Christian friends. I had never seen an altar call. I had never seen any of that. I had never heard of it. I bowed my head and as best as I can recall, I said, Lord, if you want the broken pieces of my life, here you go. That was it. And I went to sleep and because I was working in Hollywood, I had one eye open for a couple of minutes and I'm looking out the window and I'm waiting for like, okay, there's gotta be like, I'm gonna see a falling star. There's gonna be lightning. There's gonna like the moon's gonna be full. There's gotta be something. But you know what it was, right? It was right in, in here. I had peace that I didn't work to get, that I didn't do anything to make happen, right? Um, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding Philippians chapter four, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I closed my eyes and woke up about eight, nine hours later, had the best sleep, and I felt like a million bucks, and I go downstairs, and um, I was living with my parents. I had just come back from Hollywood. My older brother had just passed away. I told my mom I'm gonna get my own apartment, and she just silently, just tears, she said, what, you don't wanna live with me and your dad anymore? I'm like, oh. I said, I'll be happy to. <clears throat> so on this particular morning, 
which was March 15th, which is my, my earthly birthday, which I just turned 63 Friday. Okay. I got saved Thursday. My birthday was Friday. Um, so I wake up and now this is my special day. This is my birthday. And not only that, it's the big three O, right? And I go downstairs and I pour myself a cup of coffee and I am just like busting at the seams. And I'm like, I gotta say, it. I gotta say it. I gotta say it. Now, my mom in her younger days went to, we went to St. Mary's church. Every one of my brothers went to grades one through eight. I was the only one that went through grades one through eight and then four more years at the local Catholic high school. And um, uh, uh, she, when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, she would go to mass four or five days a week. She became the librarian at the Catholic school that was part of the church. And she was gonna be a nun before my dad came back from serving in World War II and proposed to her, right? That's how Catholic that she was. So now I had read this passage about Joseph in his dream that's about to get him thrown into a pit. All I knew is that I was saved and I was still figuring it out. Um, and I went downstairs, I poured myself a cup of coffee. My dad's sitting there, my mom's sitting. I can see it like it was five minutes ago. And I'm like, busting. And my mom says, okay, what's your news? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I got saved. <laughs> and she looks at me and she's like, what do you mean? I said, last night, I opened up, you know that Bible that dad stole from the hotel room back in 1968? I went downstairs last night at midnight and I found that book and I opened it up. I read John 3.16 and I got saved. Now, I'm the only one excited at the table. My dad is historically non-verbal. Non um, and my mom, she, in her younger days, she took an IQ test uh, at 152. So my mom was super crazy smart. She would save up the New York Times crossword puzzles for 30 days at a time and then make herself a cup of tea, sit on the couch and do them all on a Sunday afternoon in pen, nothing crossed out. That's how smart my mom was. And I'm telling her, I got saved and I start describing what happened. And she said, I don't understand you were baptized as a baby in the Catholic Church. And now I realize that in my exuberance to share my <laughs> testimony, that my mom was deeply offended. She said, we baptized you Roman Catholic. What do you mean you got saved? And then she got real quiet. And you know what she said to me? She said, you're a heretic. That hurt. That really, really hurt. Because from her perspective, I had left the Roman Catholic Church, which I obviously did. Um, but she said, and she, I mean, she was famous for her sarcasm. There was no sarcasm there. There was no humor. She said, you're a heretic. And I thought, wow, maybe I do need to get that apart. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, the situation calmed down um, I never heard her raise her voice ever in my entire life. Um, she was just that type of person, uh, very strong, small. She was five feet tall, 120 pounds. Um, but she, she never yelled one time. She never raised her voice. I mean, to what I would consider raising your voice, not one time. And then she thought about it and then she kind of let it kind of wash away. But can you imagine Joseph waking up the next day with that great dream and says, hey guys, guess what? Well, no, guess what for you? We're about to throw you into a pit. But that was the open door for Joseph. Now you would think, well, if I was God, I wouldn't give that as an open door. I would do something a little bit easier than all those things. But that's not how God works. Um, there's a Chinese proverb about a prince in his garden. And he has beautiful gardens that are curated and everything is proper and in its place. And this prince looks one day and he sees um, a cocoon opening up and a butterfly trying to get out. 
and he sees the butterfly struggling with his wings and it's opening but it's opening so slowly and the chinese prince was filled with compassion for the butterfly just wanted to help the butterfly like last night we have a feral cat that lives in our yard and we call her mama cat and um she had spent some time with papa cat about seven weeks ago maybe 10 weeks ago and now mama cat was pregnant cat and uh, we have been watching every single day for mama cat to give birth to the baby kittens well last night was the night and um, when we left the house this morning there were four kittens in that box but but there was a struggle those kittens just didn't pop out right how many of you women have given birth and it was over in 10 minutes right <laughs> i think that's a rhetorical statement um it's a process and it's hard and there is struggle and so this chinese prince he's looking at this butterfly and the butterfly can't get the thing open and so in his compassion you know what he does well if i was god what would i do i would take that burden off of somebody so he takes the burden off of the butterfly the butterfly takes two or three steps out of the cocoon never leaves the shelf never leaves the whatever that thing was that the that the thing was sitting on and then a day or two later the butterfly was dead you know what that prince didn't know that he would have known if he would have read this book that when god is getting ready to grow you he's going to put you through a time of struggle he's going to put you through a time of trial when god wants to redeem his chosen people what does he do he institutes something called the time of jacob's trouble and he is going to use that time to judge his people not for the purpose of destroying them but for the purpose of redeeming them so when i got saved like joseph he had to go tell his dream and all that crazy stuff happened i had to go tell my roman catholic mother who wanted to be a nun before she got married who went to church five times a week that i just became a christian <laughs> and i got saved now you get to the end of that story and it's april april 5th of 1998 and my mom is dying of liver cancer started in her lungs went to her liver um she had been in the hospital in and out for a couple of months she had chemotherapy she got a two and a half year um re remission and um we thought that she had beaten it but then it came back and she wound up in the hospital and um she was starting to turn yellow her liver was starting to fail and one day a roman catholic lay minister this woman walks in with this golden bowl and she says pat would you like to receive the body of christ now i normally try to keep a respectful tone when i am dealing with people uh, who are in a position of some kind of authority um, if you have an honorary phd I have no problem calling you doctor if you know that's what your deal is i try to be as respectful as possible um but on this particular day <laughs> and she walks in holding this golden bowl and i knew what it was would you like to receive the body of christ without just like i was watching somebody else do it i leapt to my feet i opened the door and with the other hand I said, out, that is not the body of Christ, that is a wafer, and she doesn't want it, get out. And that surprised even me, because you know, I don't normally talk like that <laughs> to other people. I'm not that confrontational. Um, I'm kind of fearless when it comes to street preaching, and I've had people spit on me and steal our tracks. I had one guy pull a switchblade, and that type of stuff doesn't really seem to bother me, but I'm not a confrontational type of person. But I kicked that lady out, and I closed the door, and I said, Mom. Now, I had, I had been witnessing to her, let's see, 91 for seven years. 
I had been witnessing to her as much as God would give me the opportunity for seven years. And I, I finally took a <coughs> chick track and I read her the chick track and you get to the end and I said, you know, mom, Jesus Christ died for your sins and you're a sinner. Can you trust him to do what's needed here? And she thought about it. She says, yes, I can trust him. I am trusting him. Amen. Last words ever. I went home, convinced I'd see her again. The phone rang 4, 4.45, 4.50 in the morning. The nurse, you had said you wanted to call. You got to get here. And I literally in my pajamas and I got in the car and I drove to the hospital. It was about maybe 10 miles away and I was doing 80, 90, 100 miles an hour. I got there. They had just pulled the sheet over her. I had just missed her. Five minutes. But guess what? God honored when he said, now you're saved. I want you to go tell your parents what happened to you last night. And it was a rough road and it was a hard road, but that's how it worked out. That's how it wound up. Let me give you one more example and I'll be done. One more example. Acts chapter 9. And so when God sets before us an open door, we don't need to figure it out. God set in front of Moody an open door, and he was going to what they call a congregational church. And what they did back in the 1800s is you bought a subscription, and let's just say that I was going to buy a subscription for, for, the, for this pew here. And maybe it would be $100 per week, but you know, back in the 1800s, maybe $5. And it would be my responsibility to fill that pew with people. That's how that, that they did it in Chicago in 1860, 61. And so Moody starts bringing in homeless people. He starts bringing in people who smelled like the alcohol they were drinking last night. And he starts bringing in a fairly rough crowd and they start getting saved. And the elders take them off to the side. And there's a million different versions of this story. Um, but they took him off to the side and said, Mr. Moody, um, we appreciate your enthusiasm, but you're bringing in the wrong type of people. Now, granted, he was bringing in the main, the lame, the halt, <laughs> right? Who are we supposed to preach to? And um, they said to him, you're gonna have to stop bringing in this crowd of people if you wanna keep coming to church here. And he said, well, if that's the condition, I don't want to keep coming to church here. And he went out and he said, I'm going to help these people. And he rented a bar one day a week, Sunday morning. He had to clean it up. He had to mop up the blood and the broken glass. And by the time he was done with that phase of his ministry, there were 1,500 Muslim orphans in that Sunday school, it had grown so large that when Abraham Lincoln came to Illinois to visit the Civil War battlefield, somebody said to him, you've got to go see what Moody's doing in Chicago. Now, that's an open door. One more example and I'll be done. Acts 9 verses 5 and 6. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished. Now, he didn't say it was impossible. He didn't say that he couldn't keep doing it. He just said, you know what? I've kind of put you in this lane, and I've set these boundaries around you, but I want you. <laughs> I want you to want this. And if you don't want it, that's fine, but... The more that you kick against it, this thing, the more you're going to get stabbed, the more you're going to bleed, the more it's going to hurt, and you're really going to be very unhappy. And so 
Saul says this, Lord, and he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. When we think about God giving us an open door, in our mind, it is a highly sanitized, kind of like a Anthony Robbins motivational speech. I went to this seminar and they pumped into me for 72 hours. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And this book says you can't do it. This book says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And when God gives us an open door, I'm standing here at this pulpit today because God gave me an open door. And we walk through it, and here we are. The question that I want to put in your mind today, and as you go out and you begin, hopefully, to think about what was said here this morning, what is the open door that God has given you? Now, you might say to me, well, brother, if you knew my life, not only I don't have time, but I definitely don't have an open door and God's not calling me to do anything. Well, I would say if you're saved, I would respectfully disagree with that position and that this book, if you'll read this book and you believe what you read, um, I had this one verse. I, I didn't know what to do with it this morning. Now I know. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Um, Daniel 6, 23, you don't have to turn there. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take up Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And I submit to you today that if you're saved and you want God to give you a course, you want God to give you an open door, again, my, my argument is he's already given it to you, you're just not seeing it. But even if he hasn't given it to you yet, let's just go on that supposition that God has no open door for you, God's not calling you to do anything. Um, I, I can't even say those words with a straight face because I don't believe it. I believe that every person here who is saved has been called to do something, that every person here has an open door to do something. And if you want to get something done for the Lord that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ, then it, it is you, not God pushing you through that door. You know, um, somebody once said that here in the South, there's a saying, Lord, make me willing to be willing. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, at salvation, God did it all for you. He shed God's blood. You can't save yourself. But your sanctification that we talked about in Sunday school this morning, that's where my dad would say you got to put on the old shoe leather express and you got to get up. Um, and then he said a few other things that I can't repeat. Uh, but you got to get up and you got to go get the job done. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time and this place. We thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, you are the door. And uh, we are just, for those of us that are saved today, we're glad and we're grateful. And Father God, for anybody listening to my voice today, either here or online, if they don't know what their course is, if they don't know what the open door is that you've given them, Lord, we just pray, I pray that you would make it clear, make it plain, so that they can get something done for you that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ. And if there's one listening today, either here, um, within the church or online, that is not saved, that doesn't know you in full pardon and forgiveness of their sins, we, we pray, Lord, that something was done and said today that would lead a lost soul to you. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that you move and work and convict any unsaved lost soul, uh, Father God, that they would be redeemed, that they would uh, get saved, 
and that you would put them under your shed blood. And Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the kittens that were born this morning, God, and just what a, just the miracle of this creation that you've made, God, and we can't wait to see it redeemed and the way it should be. And uh, Lord, we just pray all these things and commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.